Hi, welcome to a celebration of Nantucket Sound. I'm Audra Parker, I'm the president and CEO of the Alliance to Protect Nantucket Sound. And for those of you joining us tonight that um, don't know our organization, we are a nonprofit environmental group based in Hyannis on Cape Cod. And our mission is the long-term protection and preservation of Nantucket Sound. And that's the body of water that lies between Cape Cod and the islands of Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket. Um, so ACONS or Celebration of Nantucket Sound is our monthly webinar series where we are trying to promote awareness of just what a special place the sound is. It's rich maritime and tribal history, its environment and its contribution to the local economy. Um, so before I introduce tonight's speaker, I just want to tell you a little bit about the work that the Alliance is doing and how critical it is. So as I mentioned, our mission is the long-term protection and preservation of Nantucket Sound. And this is especially important because Nantucket Sound has a very unique um, jurisdictional split. As you can see from this map, the darker blue waters in the center are under federal jurisdiction, while the state waters in the lighter color that run three miles from the shoreline of Cape Cod, Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket are under the jurisdiction of the state, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and are protected under the Massachusetts Ocean Sanctuaries Act, um, while the federal waters are not. And if you look at the next picture, if we can get this up. Yeah, that's great, thank you. Um, this shows you from 1992, um, a map of the ocean sanctuaries of Massachusetts. And as you can see, the majority um, of Massachusetts waters are protected as ocean sanctuaries, while the whole center of Nantucket Sound is not. Um, so we are working on getting federal legislation enacted, which would be called the Nantucket Sound National Historic Landmark Act. And that would do three important things. First of all, it would recognize Nantucket Sound's rich history by designating it as a national historic landmark. And that's the highest level of historic protection possible. And to give you examples, the entire island of Nantucket is a national historic landmark as is Wesleyan Grove in Oak Bluffs on the Vineyard and the Kennedy Compound um, in Hyannisport on the Cape are all examples of national historic landmarks. So the legislation would tie that all together and designate Nantucket Sound also as a historic landmark. The legislation would also improve the consistency between the protections that exist for the state waters of Nantucket Sound um, with those that are missing in the federal waters in the center. And finally, um, the, the federal bill would add important environmental protections for Nantucket Sound to address things that we're seeing like diminished water quality. Um, and this, this bill is very widely supported by a diverse coalition of groups representing local town governments, tribal entities, navigational interests, historic preservation groups, environmental groups, and, and, and many, many others. So at, at the end of the day, the idea is to protect and preserve Nantucket Sound and protect traditional uses like fishing and recreation. So that's, that's the work we're doing. And um, thank you for all of us, all of you who are supporting us. So um, without, without wasting any more time, let me introduce Bill Sargent, our speaker for the night. Bill was a consultant for the Nova Science TV series, and he has written 27 books on science and the environment, including Crab Wars, a tale of horseshoe crabs, COVID and human health. So I'm sure that'll be interesting to hear about. Um, Bill studied at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution and was the first director of the National Aquarium in Baltimore. And finally, he's taught science writing at Harvard University and worked on the status of horseshoe crabs in Pleasant Bay. So with that, um, welcome, Bill. We're very excited to hear what you have to say about, about horseshoe crabs in Nantucket Sound. I see Thank you. Thank you very much, Audra. 
You're I'll welcome. See you too. <laughs> yeah. So I will. Um, I will. I will get off, and then after you're done with your presentation, I'll come back. Just for the audience, the uh, video capacity is off, so you'll only see me and Bill. But you can feel free to submit your questions um, in the in the Q and A function throughout or afterwards, and then I'll come back on and we'll facilitate questions from the audience. So I look forward to to learning more about horseshoe crabs. So thank you. Thank you very much, Audra. Um, <clears throat> Uh, first of all, let's get the, the slides up here. Okay. Uh, first of all, well, thank you very much for inviting me. And actually, this is this is a little bit of a payback because years ago, I was invited to give a lecture on Nantucket but I was also invited to give a lecture on the same night and on Bermuda. And uh, I figured out it was gonna take me five hours to get to Nantucket and only two hours to get to Bermuda. And it was a, it was a gray March uh, day. And so I decided I would opt for, for uh, Bermuda. Uh, so now I'm, I'm making that up by, uh, uh, by being here tonight, uh, thanks to Zoom. Probably in the days of Zoom, I could have pulled off doing both of them. But anyway, um, this is Pleasant Bay. It's right on the elbow of, of Cape Cod. Um, the interesting thing about Pleasant Bay, it's about 12 miles long and it's a couple miles wide. But what's of particular interest to naturalists is that 90% of the bay is less than six feet deep. Um, and this makes it, uh, you know, a naturalist delight, but a boater's nightmare. Um, but it also makes it, it's a particularly good place for horseshoe crabs, not only to live, but it's also a particularly good place to, uh, to catch the horseshoe crabs because the water is very clear, it's very shallow, and they've actually been collecting horseshoe crabs in Pleasant Bay ever since uh, the, the 70s, uh, when the limulus lysate industry first, first got started. Um, so we are going to, uh, uh, let's see here. Okay, um, we're gonna borrow, this was the Channel 5 news helicopter. This was in, you know, before the days where you had your own drone. Uh, so you had to beg, borrow, or steal some time on a um, uh, on, on a helicopter. But it cost about, I think, a hundred twenty-five uh, dollars an hour to go up in one of these things. But they they lent it to us for the for the night. Um, and uh, anyway, so we're going out over uh, out over Pleasant Bay. And uh, we're going to this little washover area where a winter storm has pushed some sand into the bay. And we're gonna go to this little parabola of, of sand and marsh grass in the bay. And this also shows you uh, how shallow uh, the, uh, the waters are there. Meanwhile, just offshore, uh, a female horseshoe crab is starting to crawl up out from underneath the sediments. And you can see she's, uh, she has, some little manidia, manidia, some silver sides that are following behind her. Um, Peter just sent me a message and I'm just gonna check on that to make sure that we're doing everything right here. Oh, he said, we, you guys look great. So I guess we're doing okay. I think he's talking about the horseshoe crabs. Anyway, uh, so this is the female horseshoe crab. And as she's starting to come towards shore, you know, she's kicking up little bits of plankton uh, that the that the mini, manidia are feeding on. Uh, finally, as she approaches the shore, she has to make her way through a stag line of male crabs. And as she approaches the shore, one of the one of the male crabs will latch on to her, and then they'll continue uh, on up to the shore. Again, the larger female in front and the smaller male behind. Um, and finally, she'll get up into the sand and she'll dig down into the sediments. So there's a single female that's digging down into the sediments to lay her eggs. And she's surrounded with about a dozen lascivious male crabs. Uh, you can see there's some egg and some sperm in the water as they're actually, actually mating. Um, and what's kind of interesting here, again, the, the males are, are smaller than the females. 
And part of the reason for that is that it allows them to get underneath each other so that they can get uh, closer to the female uh, so they have the majority of, of fertilization. Uh, and of course, it, it makes more sense for the females to be large because they want to lay you know, hundreds of thousands of eggs. They lay about, about 80,000 eggs uh, during a single tidal cycle. So here the female is digging down uh, into the sediments and you can see this is the large compound eye. Uh, horseshoe crabs have uh, actually nine eyes in all. Uh, and this is the, the compound eye that runs from the brain, uh, from, the, from, from the compound eye, there's a, <laughs> what's called the uh, giant axon that runs from the compound eye to the brain. And the brain lies in a circle around the mouth. So these guys actually eat through their brains. I don't know if any of you do that. I do that about three times a day. But most of what we know about human vision comes from research on the optic nerve of the horseshoe crab. There was a Dr. H. Keffer Hartline who won the Nobel Prize in 1967 for his, for his research on the, on the uh, optic nerve of the, of the horseshoe crab. Um, uh, one of the difficult things when you're trying to film the crabs is they consider anything in the water to be a large female horseshoe crab. So as you're trying to film them, each foot will be surrounded with 30 or 40 lascivious male crabs. And so what we would do is one person would be in charge of filming and then two people would be in charge of keeping the horseshoe crabs uh, off, off his feet. Um, and then finally, as the tide started to go out, there were about 300 horseshoe crabs that all got caught in that original parabola of sand uh, they all started to swim in a clockwise direction. And if anybody could figure out why they're swimming in a clockwise direction, they would probably win a Nobel Prize as, as well. Um, then they would make it uh, down into the sand. They would, it, the ones that couldn't get out of, the, uh, get out of that little uh, parabola of sand would dig down into the sediments and wait for the, and wait for the next high tide. Uh, and uh, those that could get out would head back out into the bay, again, the larger female in front and the, and the smaller male behind. And um, this just simply shows you that horseshoe crabs like to, to mate with anything. Uh, then those eggs stay in the sediments uh, until the next full moon high tide uh, a month later. And then they hatch out as what are called trilobite larvae. Um, and this also gives you an idea of their, of their ancient heritage. And you can see the, the, the two compound eyes uh, are developing up in front. Uh, and and but th they'll be part of the plankton for about 14 days. Uh, now, the other thing that's of interest about horseshoe crabs are their blood. If we have a wound like this, we have a whole series of antibodies that go to the area and fight the infection. What horseshoe crabs have is a single kind of uh, what are called amoebocyte cells. And these amoebocyte cells simply migrate to the area and coagulate and keep the infection out. So it's actually the first immune system of the, of the animal can, kingdom. It's very, very primitive. It only has this single kind of cell, but it's worked for the past 450 million years. Uh, so it, um, uh, it seems to be very uh, effective. Uh, but what scientists are able to do now is they uh, collect the crabs, uh, bleed them uh, through the hinge between the two parts of the shell uh, and make what's called limulus amoebocyte lysate. And anything that's going to come in contact with the human blood system has to be tested to make sure that it's free of what are called gram negative bacteria. Uh, and the way that we do that now is with the horseshoe crab uh, test. And it's a, it's a very, very sensitive, very sophisticated um, uh, bioassay. And all of, the, all of the COVID vaccines and all the antibody tests all had to be tested with horseshoe crab blood to make sure that they weren't, uh, that they weren't contaminated with gram negative bacteria. Uh, another part of this story and probably why they first evolved that immune system is you have little white, what are called Delura candida, little white flatworms, and you'll see them crawling along the bottom of the shell. And what they do is they will lay their eggs in the tissues of the, of the book gills of the horseshoe crabs. And then when they hatch out, they tear those tissues. 
and that can allow the water to get in. And the waters around here are absolutely full of gram negative bacteria. Uh, so that could be instant death to them if they, if they didn't uh, have this immune system. Uh, so this is the, the bleeding operation. You can see there's a, there's a wooden rack there that they're held in. And uh, you could see that, um, you know, these horseshoe crabs don't look very good after, after being bled. Um, a lot of them, uh, you know, if they're healthy, they'll be, they'll be uh, clinched up the way some of these are. The other ones that are lying flat um, have, have probably had too much blood taken out of them. Basically what you do is they, you bleed the crab and after about 30% of the blood is out, uh, then the blood stops flowing and you stop the operation. Um, and, then, uh, and then you return them to the water. And so theoretically there should be no mortality, but under industrial conditions, the truck won't show up. Uh, the horseshoe crabs will be left out in the sun and, you'll, and you can get very, very high mortality. Um, okay. Uh, again, this is a close up of the bleeding operation. This is the blue copper based blood. Uh, they have a copper based blood because they're very ancient. They were actually, they developed their, they evolved their blood system before there was that much oxygen uh, on, on land. This is Stanley Watson, uh, who developed the first company uh, that produced the uh, limitless lysate. And what we did in those early days, we set up a little marine biology laboratory uh, and we would go out and we would collect the crabs and then monitor their recovery um, uh, after, after bleeding. And we had students come in from all over the country to, uh, to do this work. Um, and we also investigated how they were collecting them. Um, and what they had in Pleasant Bay were these large floating uh, carboys. And each one of these could hold uh, several hundred crabs. So they would go out and they may capture say a thousand or two thousand a day and then they would hold these in the carboys and then they might um, you know drive 500 a day to be bled at the laboratory and then return back uh, and they would keep uh, um, sort of rotating them that way uh, and there were about 15 of these carboys uh, spread out uh, throughout throughout the bay um, and this is the associates of cape cod it originally started as a as a real estate firm uh, Stanley Watson started it as a, as a real estate firm with his wife. Uh, and then when he realized that there was a, a market for horseshoe crab blood, uh, he, he changed uh, the company over to, uh, to producing the, the limulus lysate. Uh, this, is, um, this is the uh, building that they built a number of years ago uh, in the uh, Falmouth Industrial Park. And that building is worth about $10 million. And that's about how much money they make uh, out, of, uh, out of collecting horseshoe crabs in Pleasant Bay every, every four or five years. Um, so it's, a, it's an incredibly lucrative uh, uh, business. And um, when I was working on my book, they weren't particularly pleased to have me, you know, uh, uh, going in and out of the laboratory. So I wasn't able to get in the laboratory, but I did find there was a little hill uh, in a, in a um, uh, graveyard across the street. And I found if I got up on the hill with a long lens, I could get some shots into the, into the main laboratory. Uh, so you can see uh, what, it, what it looks like here. And in the old days, they would simply exsanguinate the crab. They would take all the blood out. Uh, and then of course you'd get, uh, you'd get very high mortality. Um, uh, this is uh, Norman Wainwright, who was the uh, chief scientist of the, of the company. And it's actually kind of interesting. Uh, it shows you sort of how, um, how siloed the company was uh, because the company was always saying that they were doing the right thing with the horseshoe crabs and they were collecting them and returning them back to where they should. And, uh, and Norman Wainwright, who was the chief scientist always assumed, well, you know, everything was, they were doing what they were saying they were doing. But one day, one of the drivers didn't show up. So he and a friend said, well, here, why don't we jump on the truck and we'll return the crabs. And they returned the crabs to Dennis. And there was a whole lineup of, uh, of fishermen sitting in their trucks. And they said, well, what are you guys doing here? And they said, we're waiting for the crabs. So basically what they were doing is they were getting the crabs back after they had been bled. 
and then using them for bait. So what you were doing is taking what you know should be 100% uh, sustainable fisheries and making it 100% uh, uh, you know mortality. Um, uh, and this also shows you that horseshoe crabs are also used for bait. So you can see these horseshoe crabs were chopped in two and used they're used for both scungili uh, and for and for eels. Uh, scungili, of course, comes from uh, from conchs. And um, so I also wanted to find out where are the where are the horseshoe crabs coming from. So I went down. This was the Woods Hole dock, and uh, I noticed that there were some you know trawlers coming in from from Nantucket Sound uh, and Vineyard Sound. They were being loaded onto a truck, uh, a seafood truck from Fairhaven, Massachusetts. Um, and uh, these were the horseshoe crabs on board. And you can see um, that you're supposed to have a wet burlap bag on top of the horseshoe crabs. And if you keep that there, they can, they can, uh, they can breathe um, uh, in, as long as you keep them moist. But if, if that burlap bag you know, gets blown off, uh, these horseshoe crabs probably aren't going to make it because they're they're going to just dry out. Um, uh, so it's it was not a particularly uh, good way to be collecting them. So anyway, um, we did we did some research in, in Pleasant Bay and uh, and we found uh, a friend of mine called George Buckley did some studies and he claimed that the that the horseshoe crabs he was looking at the immature crabs and he was saying, you know, Bill, the, the, the horseshoe crabs are, are um, you know, the population is, is crashing. But I kept saying, but George, you know, if you look in the bay, it's full of lots of, of uh, you know, large, mostly female horseshoe crabs. And we went back and forth and, uh, you know, he said my writing was terrible. And I said his field technique, uh, you know, the lacked rigor. And uh, we went back and forth. And finally, we said, well, you know, let's really try to figure this out. So what happened is that there were a number of studies that were done. Uh, this was uh, done by the Marine Biological Laboratory in Woods Hole, and they got $60,000 uh, basically to, to count the number of horseshoe crabs in Pleasant Bay. Um, and then the uh, Cape Cod National Seashore got a grant for about $30,000 to do the same thing. Um, and um, so basically, uh, and what, what, what they found is uh, the original MBL study found that there were about uh, a million horseshoe crabs in Pleasant Bay. And anybody who was familiar with the horseshoe crabs in Pleasant Bay knew that that was absurd uh, because if that were true, when the horseshoe crabs were mating, you would see hundreds and thousands of horseshoe crabs on the beach. We see maybe hundreds, uh, more like dozens. Uh, so it's considerably less than that. And basically what was going on is that um, the horseshoe crabs uh, spend their time in deep water and then they go over to the east part of the bay to lay their eggs. Um, and this is often where they're caught by the, uh, by the collectors. Uh, they're bled and then they're returned to the deeper part of the bay. Uh, and so what the, um, what the people who were doing the studying did is they set out this grid and they counted all the horseshoe crabs that they found on each point on this grid. But what they were doing is they were counting the horseshoe crabs uh, in June when they went to the west into the east, and then in July when they went to the west, and then in August when they went to the east, and September when they went to the west. So basically, they got about four times more horseshoe crabs than were than were actually uh, in the in the bay. Um, and this just simply shows you some of the work that the, uh, that the Cape Cod National Seashore scientists were doing. And you could see they tag the horseshoe crabs uh, on, the, um, on the shore uh, when they came up to mate. And then they collected the, um, uh, the, the tags in the deeper water where they had, they had migrated. So that just simply shows you that the horseshoe crabs were migrating uh, back and forth across the, across the bay. Um, okay, yep. Um, okay, it's very hard for me to see these. <laughs> okay, um, so this simply shows you what the population looked like 
uh, when we did a Nova film about a year in the life of Pleasant Bay. And this was back in 1978, 1979. And you could see there were these clusters of, of horseshoe crabs uh, that, were, that were all mating. Uh, again, another cluster, a larger cluster, and there's a single female under each one of these, and maybe there's uh, you know, 30 or 40,000 uh, males surrounding it. Um, and this is what it looked like uh, in the year 2000, uh, when there was, a, there was a federal court case uh, that came up, and uh, this was part of the studies were being done for the, for the federal court case. But you can see the water quality is less, uh, you'll only see a, thing, a single female with, a, with an attached male and then maybe a satellite male. They have a lot of epiphytes on them because the water quality is, is not as good. Um, and so the population was, was, uh, was in trouble. Um, so what we decided uh, is that, well, okay, you know, George was saying that he was seeing a, a decline in the, in the immature population. And I was... Uh, seeing that the that the uh, population of, of mature crabs was doing fine, but I also realized that the crabs that I was seeing were larger than what I remembered as growing up as a kid. I mean, most people didn't notice this because they don't look very closely at horseshoe crabs, but I realized that uh, the largest horseshoe crab you would see uh, when I was a kid about was about the size of your outstretched hand. And all of a sudden, there were much larger horseshoe crabs. So we decided, OK, let's go out and figure this out. So we started uh, going out and measuring across the prosoma uh, of, the, of the horseshoe crabs. And, um, and basically, this is the horseshoe crab on the left. Uh, the horseshoe crab on the right is the size that, that I remembered seeing as growing up uh, as a kid. The horseshoe crab on the left is what we were seeing um, uh, uh, in the in the year 2000. Then I remember that there was a scientist called Carl Schuster, and he had measured the horseshoe crabs from Maine all the way down to Florida. And he went in and out of all of these various coves. You can see Pleasant Bay is there, Woods Hole, Bullock's Cove. Um, and he counted and he measured both the males and the females. Uh, so you can see this was the size of the uh, of the males on the left on Pleasant Bay, and then the size of the females uh, in the darker uh, uh, band on the right. And, um, and so what we did is we went out, he, he measured about 500 crabs, and we went out and measured about 500 crabs, and then we put them on a graph. And you can see this, this large uh, surge, if you will, on the graph, was the size of the, uh, of the males. And they were the same size as they had been in the 50s and 60s. And then the females had two humps. One of them were the size that you had in the 50s and 60s, and then you had a little extra hump. And these were the ones that were basically too large to be coming from, from, uh, from Pleasant Bay. Uh, so, we, so we realized that, that something wasn't, that wasn't, quite, uh, uh, wasn't quite kosher. Um, and this just simply shows you there's about a half a dozen uh, shorebirds that are dependent on horseshoe crab eggs uh, uh, for their migration, particularly the red knot, about 80% of all the red knots in the world uh, travel from Tierra del Fuego and the tip of, of South America up to the Arctic Circle, and they time their migration so they're on the beaches, the Delaware Bay beaches, uh, when the horseshoe crabs are laying their eggs, and they'll eat about 40 tons of horseshoe crab eggs, and that gives them the, the, the fuel to make the next uh, hop of their, of their migration. Um, so as part of this uh, court case, we had to first determine that the, uh, uh, that the red knots and some of the other shorebirds were actually eating the horseshoe crab eggs. So we came up with some of these uh, photographs and you can actually see there's a couple little horseshoe crab eggs on the bill of this, of this shorebird. And there's a lot of horseshoe crab eggs that are, that are being laid in the, in the water, but that actually wasn't good enough. And um, the, the judge uh, had uh, the um, Massachusetts Audubon had to actually go out and euthanize uh, some of the shorebirds and then count the number of, of eggs that they were in that were in there and sure enough, they found that, the, um, that they were eating the horseshoe crabs. 
uh, eggs. And this just simply shows you that the horseshoe crabs are kind of a, a keystone species. Um, uh, you know, when they lay their eggs, all kinds of, of creatures uh, start feeding on them, little, um, you know, fish, worms, and then right up to the, to the uh, striped bass um, that's uh, feeding on the manidia, manidia, the silver sides that are feeding on the, on the horseshoe crab eggs. Uh, this just simply shows you that, that you tend to have two clutches of, of horseshoe crab eggs uh, in, the, in the females. Um, and so anyway, George and I said, well, you know, everybody's doing these studies and they have large amounts of, mo of money to do it. We have about 10 years worth of data. So uh, we said, it's, you know, it's finally time to publish. So we both reached into our back pocket and we took out 20 bucks and uh, we, we put together this paper. And I like to think that this was the paper that, um, that actually uh, won the federal, the, the federal court case. Um, so this is a, uh, a horseshoe crab shell and quite often you'll see these on the beach and uh, it looks like you may be seeing a dead horseshoe crab. But if you look carefully, you'll see there's a crack along the leading edge of the shell. And that's where the horseshoe crab has crawled out and, and left that empty shell uh, behind. They crawl out, they take all their legs and their gills and everything uh, come out. And this again is the operation. You can see this is the empty shell up here on the right. And the horseshoe crab is down here on the left and the, the shell has just come off and he has this nice gray, healthy, uh, healthy cover to color to him. And then they swell out by about a fourth after a few hours uh, and then their shell will, will harden again. Um, and you'll see lots of horseshoe crabs like this uh, in, the, in, the, in the rack line, the shells of all the, of all the horseshoe crabs. And this is what, uh, you know, what it looked like uh, before 2000 when you had a healthy population in there and you would have, what we did is we, we would have a hundred meter transect and we would walk along that transect and simply count the number of horseshoe crab eggs. Uh, and, you, and you had, you know, hundreds uh, and hundreds of these uh, little um, uh, molts. Uh, and, um, uh, and so that was, that was what the, what that, that was what the, uh, the, the um, you know, the, the healthy population looked like. This simply shows you where the horseshoe crabs are collected. Some of them are, were collected down here in Monomoy and others were collected up in, in Pleasant Bay. And we finally realized that some of the, the larger horseshoe crabs were coming from Monomoy and then were being released in Pleasant Bay. So we finally figured out some of the numbers and we figured you had about 40,000 horseshoe crabs coming from the Monomoy area, about 28,000 coming from Pleasant Bay, about 10,000 coming from Dennis. So 60,000 in all going to the associates of Cape Cod and Falmouth. But then you also had 60,000 crabs that were coming from Rhode Island and 10,000 coming from Chincoteague. Um, and then you also had about 10,000 crabs coming from Nantucket Sound and, and, and Vineyard Sound. Um, so they were coming from all over uh, and, uh, and, and, in quite, and in quite large numbers. And then this just simply shows you the three main companies in the early days, the Associates of Cape Cod, that has sim and they were, they were collecting about 130,000 uh, horseshoe crabs a year. Uh, they are now owned by Sega Kaku, which is a Japanese firm. Uh, and then you had Bio Whitaker uh, in the Maryland area. And they had kind of an interesting operation because they had a remote laboratory. So what they would simply do is they would go out and they would collect the crabs, bring them into the remote laboratory, bleed out the raw lysate, and then release the crabs right away, and then take the raw lysate to their main laboratory. Um, and so they had uh, very low mortality. Uh, you had very high mortality when you were collecting the crabs, you know, in Chincoteague Bay, bringing them all the way up to Associates of, Cra of Cape Cod, bleeding them, and then presumably bring bringing them all the way back down to, to Chincoteague Bay, or uh, which is what they should have been doing. But I think some of them were going to Monomoy and some were coming, uh, you know, going into Pleasant Bay. And then you also had Endosafe, which is down here in South Carolina, 
they were collecting about 100,000 crabs um, and they were also collecting them from the, uh, from the uh, Delaware Bay uh, area. Um, and they, were, they are the only state uh, on the Atlantic coast that has passed a regulation so you can only use the horseshoe crabs for biomedical purposes uh, in, in, uh, in South Carolina. Okay, uh, this just simply shows you some of the red knots and you can see some of these have been tagged. Um, and they will, that little family group will stay together. So you'll see them in Tierra del Fuego, then you'll see them on, on the Delaware Bay beaches, and then you'll see them up above the, uh, up above the Arctic Circle. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, this is what it looks like in Delaware Bay. You'll see hundreds and thousands uh, of the uh, red knots and all kinds of other birds uh, that are feeding on hundreds and thousands of eggs that are being released by the horseshoe crabs. You can see a number of the eggs have been kicked up uh, here uh, in, the, in, the feeding, in the feeding frenzy. Um, so my first book came out uh, called Crab Wars, A Tale of Horseshoe Crabs, Bioterrorism and Human Health. Uh, it was called Bioterrorism because I actually wrote it right, when, um, the, uh, right after 9-11 uh, and people were concerned about anthrax and actually horseshoe crab blood was then being used to test uh, to make sure that some of the, the vaccines for things like smallpox and anthrax were free of, of uh, pyrogens. Um, and this was the company, a very small company in Cambridge, Massachusetts and Cambridge, England, uh, a little bit like Moderna. Um, it, was, it was a little startup company. No one expected that they would get the, get the contract to produce uh, all the, the um, smallpox vaccine uh, for the United States Army, um, and uh, but it turns out they had the best science uh, and did and did win the uh, the contract. And this just simply shows you kind of where we are now. Um, there's a, a scientist in Singapore who has used gene splicing to isolate factor C, and then you have this sort of biological cascade uh, and to make an artificial form of, of lysate. Um, this will obviously protect the horseshoe crabs, uh, but I don't think it's, I'm kind of old school on this. Um, I think that the test is not as sensitive and it's more expensive and it's more difficult to use than the natural test. So I think eventually the Food and Drug Administration will Accept this new uh, this this new way of making the the, the lysate, uh, but I still think um, the gold standard is going to be the live uh, animal form, uh, and so you're still going to be using um, being you know using some horseshoe crabs. Basically, what the Food and Drug Administration has been doing is they didn't want to change horses in midstream in the middle of the pandemic. So they felt they had about 30 years of good data uh, with the natural form of lysate, uh, but only about two years of data with the, uh, with the artificial form. Um, so that's kind of where we stand now. Uh, this is just simply, uh, I'm, I'm dating myself here, but this just simply shows you that if we, if we manage the horseshoe crabs as well as we've been managing animals like, like, uh, like lobsters, uh, then, then um, uh, we can continue uh, to help have a, a healthy population. And this just sim simply shows you, this was earlier this year, uh, and uh, this was taken, a, excuse me, this was taken a couple years ago, uh, and you could see, again, a nice healthy population of immature crabs. And then I went down uh, in September of this year, and you could see there was only a pair of horseshoe crabs in about a you know, 100, 100 foot length of beach. Uh, so I think what was going on, because the demand for lysate was so high, the collectors, the companies and the collectors were starting to collect the horseshoe crabs uh, uh, in the shallow waters. Um, uh, and this, this had been the case with the, with the federal court case where they were actually collecting the crabs in the waters of the, of the Cape Cod National uh, Seashore. Um, and uh, 
this just simply shows you that uh, hinge, and you can see where 90% of the horseshoe crabs in Pleasant Bay uh, have you know, fungal uh, infections around their hinges because 90% of the horseshoe crabs in Pleasant Bay are caught every summer and bled and then returned back to the, back to the bay. Um, so here we are uh, leaving the horseshoe crabs at the, at the end of the, of the day. And, um, and I thank you very much. There we go. Great. Okay. Thank you. With some operator <laughs> operator you. problems. I was I was too busy like transfixed and looking at the pictures that you were showing. So that was very <laughs> very very interesting. Um, I have a number of questions from the audience, um, but before I even ask that, my question to you is: How did you first get interested in horseshoe crabs? Um, you know, growing up as a kid on the Cape, uh, and I was always fascinated with them. You know, I, I grew up as sort of a happy heathen. Uh, you know, my my parents would. I had a little. Flat has has something has something changed? No, nothing. <laughs> I'm still happy. I might be a little more heathenish, um, but I used to spend all my days. You know, I just get up first thing in the morning, and I'd be out all day in my boat, uh, and I just became fascinated with horseshoe crabs as as a kid. Uh, and then that developed into uh, starting to look at them a little bit more scientifically when we set up the laboratory. And uh, I guess I've been doing that ever since. Great. Um, so I, I will I will mention uh, as part of that, um, and probably some of you might mention, you know, as Cape Cod kids, we were all told that horseshoe crabs were shellfish predators. And so what you were supposed to do is go out and catch the horseshoe crabs uh, and bury them and then turn in their, in their tails. And I think you've got two cents a tail for the horseshoe crabs. I never really liked doing that very much, but we were taught to do it. And actually what happened is we had, um, we had four generations of dogs that, that would watch us. And the first generation, you know, he picked it up and he would spend hours going out you know, wading in the shallow waters. And when he fell to horseshoe crab, he'd put his head down and grab it by the tail, bring it up on the shore. It would flip over and start crawling and dig a hole in front of it and it would tumble down in the hole and he'd bury it. And then he'd go out and get it and get another one. He taught that to four generations of dogs, but by the fourth generation, they would just bring them up on the beach and bark at them all day. <laughs> I'm sure there's some sort of like commentary we can make about that, but... <laughs> um, so who was it that was paying you for the for the tails? Uh, that was the state. Oh, really? OK. That was a, yeah, that, that was like a state bounty system. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. OK, um, I'm going to get I'm questions. still trying to make up for that. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to um, take some questions from the audience. First of all, somebody comments that it was a great soundtrack that we started with. So that is our our colleague, Peter, that was responsible for that. Um, I'll second that. Sam Lowe says, hi, Bill. Aloha from hi. Sam Lowe. Aloha. <laughs> Aloha, Sam. <laughs> you seem to have a, um, a whole crew here watching. You have a hi from Gene and David Bundy. Oh, really? From Alaska? I, wow. I guess. I don't know. Um, I guess yes. so. OK. Um, and Sam was, Sam was from Hawaii originally, but he's on Nantucket now. Okay, there you go, all over the place for you. Um, Susan asks, says, you mentioned that the female horseshoe crabs were larger in the 1970s survey. Were you able to conclude why there was this change in the size of the females? Uh, basically, they were coming in, but, but, but basically you have, you have horseshoe crabs from Maine all the way down to the Yucatan Peninsula. And you have the most crabs and the largest crabs in the Delaware Bay area. And then they get smaller and fewer as you both go both north and south. So what happens is that each little individual bay will have a different size horseshoe crab. Uh, so what was happening is, is the crabs were be co being collected from other areas, bled at the laboratory, and then returned back to Pleasant Bay. So what we were seeing were the larger crabs 
coming in from places like Rhode Island and uh, and Monomoy. So in Delaware Bay, if they're the if they're the largest ones, is that because of the weather there, the climate, or is that something that they're eating? Uh, it's pretty much the, the climate. Um, basically, you, the, you, there are about five different species of horseshoe crabs. Uh, there's only a single species on the east coast of the of the United States, and then you have about four uh, Asian species. But you always find horseshoe crabs on the west side of the oceans, and that's where we have the the Gulf Stream, which gives you that nice long stretch of sort of moderately warm waters. And you have the same thing in Asia with the Japanese current. Um, uh, so that that's. So it, it's a climatological thing. We actually, the smallest crabs that you get on the East Coast are up here in the, in the uh, Newburyport area. And the reason for that is you have the Merrimack River. So not only is the water cold, uh, but it's fresh. And so they're, they have a tough time. Um, you know, it's not a very good environment for them. What's the difference between the Asian species and the species we have here? Um, the kind of minor differences, um, uh, you know, originally there was a single species that was worldwide, you know, 450 million years ago. And then as the continents have, you know, come to their present configuration, uh, some of those have been cut off and you've had these, you know, different populations and that have then speciated. So you have uh, five, five different species now. Okay. They're, they're, you know, they're, they're about the same size and some of the shape is a little bit different. Fairly minor differences, really. Okay. Sandy asks, what is the current health of the horseshoe crab and what does the future look like for them? Well, I think uh, a lot of this has to do with, um, you know, if when, when the Food and Drug Administration accepts the gene splicing form of, of, uh, of limulus lysate, uh, then the pressure will, will be off horseshoe crabs. And I think, um, you know, and then they will recover, they'll recover fairly quickly because, you know, each female horseshoe crab can lay 80,000 eggs. Uh, and um, so if, you know, only a handful of those survive, uh, the, the population is going to still recover fairly quickly. 80,000 in a lifetime? Uh, 80,000 in a single life, in a single tidal cycle. Wow. So they, they lay their eggs under the full moon and the new moon, and they lay them for about four days. So okay. they'll start laying them. And they lay sort of little uh, boluses of maybe four or 5,000 eggs at a time. Uh, and then it's and then it'll be 80,000 over that four or five day uh, period. I'm ignoring all the questions from the audience because I have so many myself, <laughs> uh, but I'll get back to them in a sec, I promise. How, how long does a horseshoe <laughs> crab live? Uh, 20 years. And they know that because um, they raised a female horseshoe crab at Wellesley College and they, and they collect, uh, you know, collected all her molts. And so she lived for, uh, for 20 years and pretty much that's what they do in the wild as well. Okay. All right. Now I'll get back to the audience. Um, <laughs> Sherry asks, are there protected areas specifically for horseshoe crabs? And are the simultaneous counts still being done? Uh, yes, there are, for instance, you know, Cape Cod National Park and, and Monomoy. And there are other uh, fish and wildlife areas, uh, you know, up and down the coast. Uh, and they're, um, they're protected, uh, you know, so, so you can't collect the horseshoe crabs in, in those waters. Um, I forget the second part of her question was... Um, Are the simultaneous counts still being done? Yes, the counts are being done um, in different areas. They've been doing them in, in the Delaware Bay area for, uh, you know, uh, decades. Uh, and uh, we have an offshore trawl uh, that Massachusetts does, uh, and they also have some trawls, and they're doing some some uh, counting down in South Carolina. Um, okay, are you? And, and, and I should I should also mention that the that the birders are studying uh, the red knots, and they've seen a decline in the red knots because they're not getting enough 
yep. eggs to make yep. their their migrations. Yeah. Okay. Helen asks, are you optimistic that the population will increase or be restored, or are you pessimistic? Um, I'm I'm actually fairly optimistic. Um, you know, I, I think I'm a lot more I'm a lot more optimistic about horseshoe crabs than I than I am about humans. They've been around, you know, for 450 million years. Um, it, I, it doesn't look like we're going to make uh, many more million years ourselves. Well, they're also laying 80,000 eggs per month or whatever. Well, we got, we've got to start working on that. Yeah. But that's yes. your department. <laughs> um, okay. Ruth says, what is being done about the fungus the crabs are getting? Uh, basically, um, well, they have that uh, factor C uh, can help them ward off the, the, the fungus. Um, pretty much, you, you know, it, it's not going to kill them. Uh, they can, they can recover, uh, the, you know, they'll get that fungus and it will bother them for a while, but most of them, most of them will recover from it. Okay. Um, Sam asks, how is the harvest of crabs monitored and controlled? Uh, <laughs> very poorly. Really? Uh, I, I remember um, when that initial court case came up, um, I think her name was Maria uh, Burks, who was the uh, uh, head of the Cape Cod National Seashore. And she said, well, you know, what are we going to do? Chase them in our pursuit canoes? Uh, I, it, there's, there's very, it's, it's pretty much all, you know, self-regulated. And, and the collectors will tell you how many crabs they're, they're collecting and where they're collecting them and where they're returning them. Uh, but, um, um, but there's no real oversight beyond that. Bill, do, do they need to have some sort of a permit to catch them or collect them? Yes. Yeah, it's, it's basically, it's pretty much the same permit that you would get for catching lobsters. Okay, and it's through the states? And it's through the state, yeah. Okay, um, it, Yvonne, Yvonne says, has anyone tried to culture the amoeba sites? Uh, well, the, the gene splicing uh, is, is kind of a way to do that. They're not culturing the amoeba sites themselves, but they're, uh, um, they're creating an artiform, artificial form of the, of the amoeba sites. Okay. Um, Tom asks, how are the crabs tagged to show that they've been bled? Do the tags get replaced year after year? Can you tell how many times they might have been caught and bled? Uh, yeah, tagging, uh, it doesn't work particularly well. Um, they've tried to do some tags and if you, the problem with the, the, is the horseshoe crabs, uh, particularly the males, um, uh, actually uh, mostly the females, you know, shed their shells every year. The younger ones will shed, shed them, you know, several times a year. As they get older, they'll shed them so if you put a tag on them, they're going to shed the shell and, and get rid of the tag. They're clever uh, crabs. Yeah, I mean people have have worked on sort of a way of tattooing them, uh, and actually you can also just clip. They have those little uh, spines that come out near their near their tail, uh, and you can clip those spines so that each spine represents a particular week. Uh, but basically, for instance, what they do in Pleasant Bay is they return the horseshoe crabs to the deeper part of the bay. And it takes the horseshoe crabs about a month to get from the deeper part of the bay to the shallow part of the bay where, they'll, where they can be caught again. And it takes them about a month to, to regenerate their blood. Uh, so you kind of don't need the tag in, in that situation. And I think other, you know, every, every area of the, uh, sorry, every area um, of the country has come up with slightly different ways of collecting the crabs uh, that make sense uh, for their area. But the problem has always been, here you have a very sophisticated biotech uh, industry, but it's supported by, um, by essentially, essentially a 17th century fisheries. Uh, and so that's sort of their Achilles heel. 
um, because they, you know, they're dependent on, on horseshoe crabs being collected this way. Um, so that's, that's always been the problem. Do, do the collectors have any kind of limits, like catch limits or no? Well, they can only, um, the, the, the bladers only want so many a day. So they might want, you know, 500 a day, or they might want, you know, up to 1700 a day. Okay. Just cause they have then, capacity constraints in the labs. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because they, they only have so many people that are bleeding them all the time and, and they have to, you know, get them in in the morning and bleed them and then, you know, get them out that afternoon. Okay. Now, Bill, I don't want you to feel bad, but Jeannie says we got five cents in Chatham. <laughs> um, well, I always knew that you Chatham guys were, were uh, we only got two cents in Orleans. Okay. Um, okay. Sherry asks if you can talk a bit more about the medical uses of the horseshoe crab blood. And are there other, second part, are there other prehistoric marine life studies you're involved in? Um, uh, I did write a book called uh, Marine Animals in Modern Medicine. Uh, I think it was called The Year of the Crab, Marine Animals in Modern And it looked at how animals like horseshoe crabs and lobsters and squid and uh, are all used in, in modern uh, medical research. And almost all the major advances that we've made in medicine have come uh, because of research on, on marine animals. And the reason for that is the marine animals are, are very primitive uh, and, and supposedly simple. So if you were gonna, you know, if you wanted to study cars, uh, you wouldn't study a Maserati, you'd go back to a Model T and try to figure it out. So that's, that's the reason why people study the horseshoe crabs and the squid and everything like that. And of course, it turns out, um, you know, for instance, with horseshoe crabs and the study of vision, it turns out that horseshoe crabs can have, they have ultraviolet vision, their vision changes under the full moon. Uh, it turns out that they're, they have a lot more complex vision than humans do. Wow. Uh, so you're, you're going to always run into, into little uh, situations like that. And the, the other part of her question was, if you could talk a bit more about, the, uh, about medical uses of the blood. Um, well, the, the main, the main thing that they're used for is that, is that test for, uh, for gram negative bacteria. Okay. Uh, and they have, each company has different ways of doing that. Um, but that, that's pretty much the, the main thing. Um, okay. Um, David says, thank you for your very informative talk. Um, your slides appear to be mostly, mostly about Pleasant Bay. Do you have knowledge right. on the current day horseshoe crabs in Nantucket Sound? Um, I just I just know that they're being collected there. Uh, you know, I was seeing I was seeing the results of that. Uh, you know, when they were being landed in in Woods Hole, um, uh, I don't have much of a of a feeling for that, and I'm not sure that uh, that other people do. Um, uh, if he has any information, I'd be, I'd be glad to hear it. Uh, it's very hard to get this kind of information, uh, not only in this state, but up and down, up and down the East Coast, uh, because there's, there's no real way of, of, of monitoring it. Well, I've seen them on the beaches, so they're definitely there. <laughs> they're they're definitely the there. The shells. And, yeah. it, and of course, the way that they're collected in Nantucket Sound and Vineyard Sound is by trawling. And you're going to have a higher mortality there simply because the horseshoe crabs are, you know, are, you're going to have a certain amount of mortality just when you catch them and they're coming up and they're all bundled together. Uh, and so you're going to have a higher overall mortality because you're going to have that mortality plus the bleeding mortality and then releasing them again. Uh, so that's, you know, that that's... Uh, Okay, That's um, <laughs> Charles is asking, is there any information on whether U.S. companies export lysate to foreign countries? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, there's a worldwide market for, for lysate now. Okay. Uh, what's interesting is that the uh, European Pharmacopeia has accepted uh, the, the um, 
what's called uh, factor C, the uh, gene splice form of, of, um, of lysate uh, for their testing. Julie. So, so yeah, go ahead. No, you go ahead. I'm sorry, I had to cut you off. Well, so, so I mean, that, that's, that's an indication that, you know, eventually the Food and Drug Administration will probably do that in, in this country. Uh, but yeah, it's a worldwide situation. And then of course you have in Asia, you have companies that are making the lysate based on the Asian crabs. And, you know, a lot of people will tell you it's not quite as good as, you know, ours, but I think a lot of that is just sort of, uh, you know, chest Try. thump. thump. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, Julie wants to know if there's a place on Cape Cod that that we could see the horseshoe sh horseshoe crabs bled. Uh, well, the Associates of Cape Cod is uh, in Falmouth. Uh, they're very reticent about uh, you know letting people in to to see what's been you know how they're doing it, um, and uh, you know I, I think. All, all the companies are fairly publicity shy. And so uh, they kind of don't want the public to see exactly what they're going. And, and again, I mean, I, I feel a little bit badly for them because again, I see this is their Achilles heel. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's a little bit like the, the human uh, blood industry. Um, you know, if you look into the human blood industry very carefully, you realize there's all kinds of problems there. You know, you're getting blood, you know, from drug addicts, you're getting it from people who need some cash quickly. Uh, uh, you may be getting it from people who are, you know, who have been sick. I mean, there was a real problem with HIV. Uh, but, and you do have an artificial form of, of human blood but it turns out it's not as good as, as you know, real blood. Um, so it's it's very similar situation. Again, it's that Achilles heels. Ba basically, you know, the, the human blood industry is a fairly sophisticated industry, except for the fact that you have to get blood out of humans. Right. <laughs> um, okay, Robert says, hi, Bill, great presentation, thank you. I spent my teen years on Pleasant Bay and share many, many of your recollections of the crabs in the 60s and 70s. I'm curious what impact of water quality de degradation has played in the Chatham-Orleans area compared with say Delaware and Chesapeake Bays. And then he says, remembering you from Noble's crew. <laughs> what was his name again? Robert Frazee. Hi, Robert, how are you? Yes. <laughs> um, Let's say I wasn't a very good crew member, as I remember, but uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, the water quality, basically, um, you know, maybe this is just New England chauvinism, uh, but I think, I think the water quality we have up here is quite a bit better, particularly in a place like Pleasant Bay, particularly now that you have the new inlets opening up, you're getting a lot of flushing uh, of, the, of the bay. So the water quality, uh, is much higher now, actually, than it was probably in the 70s or 80s when you had a lot of development, and it was before you had the inlets opened up, and then uh, then you were getting a lot of eutrophication, uh, and so now I think that's that's improved, improving. Um, I don't I don't know the exact situation in Delaware Bay. Uh, I, I'm also a chauvinist. You know, they always. All of the filming that they do, they always, when they want to do a film on horseshoe crabs, they film them on Delaware Bay because there's a lot more horseshoe crabs there. But the water quality is terrible. You know, it's all sort of muddy and on a gray bottom and stuff like that. I love the, the you know, the Pleasant Bay area because you have that nice white sand and That's these, beautiful. you know, black, black horseshoe crabs crawling on them. Uh, so I think we have, we have much better visual quality up here. I'll have to agree with you. Um, <laughs> Sue says, is there any hope of the population coming back on Nantucket and Tuckernuck? Uh, yeah, again, I think, you know, as soon as the pressure is taken off, I mean, that's the wonderful thing about almost all marine species is they're very fecund uh, little organisms. And if you just give them the slightest chance, uh, they're going to bounce back because they're they're laying so so many eggs. You know, a 
you know, an, an oyster will lay a million eggs a year and a horseshoe crab will lay about 80,000 uh, crabs in a single tidal cycle. So you've got a lot to work with. Um, uh, Jean is um, asking me to send her my email because she apparently will send me an essay that she wrote on your on your book for the Anchorage Press. So I'm sure you're aware okay. of that. So I will do that. Jean, thank you. Um, Chase asks, are you aware of any other time in history when horseshoe crabs had economic value or were they only shellfish predators and a nuisance? Uh, no, there was a, uh, in the 1930s, there was a huge industry uh, for uh, horseshoe crab fertilizer and they used them, uh, they used them as, and they also used them as uh, poultry feed, um, but it was mostly the, the fertilizer industry and they would collect millions and millions of horseshoe crabs. And this is basically, this really drove down uh, the Delaware Bay population before the industry started up and before they were then used as, as uh, bait, um, you know, for fisheries bait. Um, and you would like to think that they stopped that for environmental reasons. It was actually because they made such a stink on the, on the beach. <laughs> You know that, uh, and they were trying to develop the area, and they, they knew they couldn't develop it if the whole place smelled like dead horseshoe crabs. So they put them out of business. Makes sense. <laughs> Some things are just that simplistic, right? Um, yep. <laughs> Nancy asks if the current population has increased since regulations. Um. Well, it's different in different areas. Um, you know, I would I would say, for instance, the Pleasant Bay population is is probably fairly stable. Um, Delaware has taken a real hit because they were, you know, they've been using them for bait. Uh, so they've they've been in in quite drastic decline uh, as well as as the uh, as the red knots because of that. Um, uh, South Carolina's population uh, is doing fairly well. Um, Susan asks, how might global warming sea level rise affect the horseshoe crab populations of Cape Cod? Uh, that's a really good question. And one of the interesting aspects about that is that you have um, you know, all of the red knots and the horseshoe crabs have to coordinate so that they're so that all the red knots will be on the beaches when the horseshoe crabs are, are laying their eggs. And so what the birds are using is, the, is the, the amount of daylight to trigger their migration. What the horseshoe crabs are using is the water temperature. So as the water temperature starts to go up, you could have those two species out of sync. And that actually might be explained some, some of what's going on now. Interesting. Uh, because the, the horseshoe crabs could be, you know, starting to, to you know, to lay their eggs earlier and the, and, the, and, the, and the red knots aren't getting up there in time. Interesting. Okay, that makes sense. Um, Kristen says, obviously they molt as they grow, but are there certain specific times as to when they will molt more often? And how old are they at their first molt? Uh, they actually start molting when they're still in their eggs. Uh, so if you look at that, they have that, what they do is they have that little tiny green egg. Uh, and then that hatches out underneath the sediments into what's called the, the bubble egg, uh, which is about a half a mile, a half a, an inch across. Oh, that's a big one. Uh, and, and, it's, and it's, it's getting late. Uh, <laughs> we'll and, we'll uh, finish up soon. <laughs> Uh, but they'll actually start molting there. So you'll see there'll be a little shell uh, on the, still in the egg. And then in their first gene, their first year, they molt about 14 times. Uh, wow. And then once they get, you know, a year or two, uh, then they're pretty much starting to just, you know, they'll molt once and they molt at the end of the summer. So the time to go out and look for the molts is in September. Okay. Um, Ted is asking, why are there so many deceased horseshoe crabs in the early summer in Cape May Bay waters? Um, hard to say. I mean, um, some of those could be molts, but it doesn't sound like 
uh, you would have them at that time of year. Um, it could be that they, you know, that these are ones that are being used for, that they're, they're being ca caught and used for bait. Uh, so you could be seeing some bycatch from that. Um, and I mean, there's a certain amount of natural uh, mortality. There's about 10% natural mortality. Uh, so you, you could be seeing that and you could be seeing, you know, uh, water quality problems There's all, all sorts of things. You know, you could, you could have a single storm uh, that might come in and, you know, wash them up on the, on the beach. Um, this is maybe the worst thing that, that, that can happen to a horseshoe crab if they get flipped over on their back. Um, and actually, you know, we probably, you know, we all grew up thinking that the horseshoe crab used that tail as a, as a, as a stinger. Uh, but actually what they do is they use that to flip themselves over. So if they get caught in their back, they, they reach that tail back and they rock back and forth and back and forth until they can flip themselves over. Um, so if they can't do that, uh, you'll, you're going to have fairly high mortality. Okay. <clears throat> Um, does the Delaware Bay Area nuclear plant affect the horseshoe crab? Um, yeah, I think again, what you would have with a with a, uh, a nuclear power plant is you have heated water, so the the horseshoe crabs could be coming into that area and and staying in it. I mean, this is this is what we were finding around the uh, Pilgrim nuclear power plant is that the striped bass. Uh, would actually hang around all year long uh, in the in the warmer water. Um, Charles is providing a Facebook URL called facebook.com slash horseshoe crab advocates and is looking, I think, for vintage photos of horseshoe crabs on Massachusetts beaches. So again, it's facebook.com horseshoe crab advocates. Um, hmm. few, last few questions. Well, Yvonne says, excellent talk. Thank you. So interesting. Kristen says, thank you so much. Love these critters. And the mm -hmm. last question is from Elizabeth. And she says, how have the horseshoe crabs been used or how have the horseshoe crabs been used for COVID vaccines? Well, uh, again, all, all the vaccines have to be tested to, the, to, to, make, their, to make sure that they're not contaminated with, with bacteria. Uh, the way that the, the horseshoe crab test was first accepted is in 1976, um, we thought we were getting uh, a recurrence of the swine flu and President Ford was in office and he wanted to prove that he could do something other than, you know, pardon President Nixon. And so he set up a program to inoculate every man, woman and child against swine flu. And what happened is that the swine flu never, never occurred. There was only one person that, that ended up getting it, but hundreds of people started getting neurological problems. And they found out that that was because that the vaccines uh, were contaminated with, with gram negative bacteria. Uh, and that's when, they, that's when they found out that the horseshoe crab test was more sensitive than the, than the live rabbit test, which is what they've been using before. Great. Um, okay. Well, I have, I think, one last question because I can't help myself and then we'll let you go. Um, how fast, uh, you showed the pictures of the small horseshoe crabs next to a person's foot and how fast, yep. do, they, how fast do they grow to full size? Uh, again, it, well, they live for about 20 years. Uh, they only gain uh, sexual maturity at 10 years. So they're actually fairly slow slow growing, slow developing. Um, and then when they shed their shell, they, they grow about a fourth. Um, so that you'll see when you look at the shells, they're very distinct sizes. Uh, so at a single year, they might be about, you know, an inch, you know, an inch across. Uh, and then the next one will be an inch and a quarter. So you can, you can, you know, figure out the year classes fairly easily. Okay, great. Well, that was, I mean, I really, really enjoyed that. Um, I'm sure the audience did as well. We had lots of questions. So thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Thank you. And I learned a lot. Okay. Yes. Um, and, yep, go ahead. 
And, and I also liked your your musical interlude beforehand, except Patty Page. I've never, I, I don't know. I have trouble with Patty. That's Page. just because now you can't get it out of your head. That's why you don't like right. it. Right. Yes. It's a little earwig. Yeah, I, know, I know. Anyway. All right. Well, okay. Well, thank you so much. And thank you to the audience for joining us. Um, I hope everyone has a deeper appreciation of horseshoe crabs and of Nantucket sound. Um, I hope you stay in touch with us. Uh, you can reach me at Audra at saveoursound.org and encourage you to follow us on social media. As I mentioned before, our webinars are monthly and we have two more scheduled in, uh, in April. April 21st, we'll have a webinar about snowy owls and that will be Zach Mertz from the Birdsea Cape Wildlife Center in Barnstable joining us. And in early June, on June 2nd, we'll have um, sea turtles in Nantucket Sound with Karen Dordeville from Mass Audubon's Wellfleet Bay Wildlife Sanctuary. So thank you again for joining us. And um, if you would like to help, um, go to saveoursound.org, donate, um, join our webinars. We have an online petition to let your local legislators know that you support the permanent protection of Nantucket Sound. So um, we look forward to your help and we look forward to seeing you at future webinars. Thank you and have a great night. Night.